This is the Nun's Priest Tale from the Canterbury Tales. This is the Penguin Classics edition. Once, long ago, there dwelt a poor widow in a small cottage by a little meadow beside a grove and standing in a dale. This widow woman of whom I tell my tale, since the sad day when last she was a wife, had led a very patient, simple life. Little she had in capital or rent, but still, by making do with what God sent, she kept herself and her, two, and her two daughters going. Three hefty sows, no more, were all her showing. Three cows as well, there was a sheep called Molly. Sooty her hall, her kitchen melancholy, and there she ate full many a, a slender meal. There was no sauce picante to spice her veal, no dainty morsel ever passed her throat. According to her cloth, she cut her coat. Repletion never left her in disquiet, and all her physic was a temperate diet, hard work for exercise and heart's content. And rich man's gout did nothing to prevent her dancing. Apoplexy struck her not. She drank no wine, nor white, nor red had got. Her board was mostly served with white and black, milk and brown bread in which she found no lack. Broiled bacon or an egg or two were common. She was, in fact, a sort of dairy woman. She had a yard that was enclosed <laughs> me. She had a yard that was enclosed about by a stockade and a dry ditch without, in which she kept a cock called Chanticleer. In all the land for crowing, he'd no peer. His voice was jollier than the organ blowing in church on Sundays. He was great at crowing. Far, far more regular than any clock or abbey bell, the crowing of this cock. The equinoctial wheel in its position, the the equinoctial, the equinoctial wheel in its position. At each ascent, he knew by intuition. At every hour, 15 degrees of movement, he crowed so well there could be no improvement. His comb was redder than fine coral, tall and battlemented like a castle wall. His bill was black and shone as bright as jet. His Like azure were his legs, and they were set on azure toes with nails of lily white, like burnished gold his feathers, flaming bright. This gentle cock was a master in some measure of seven hens, all there to do his pleasure. They were his sisters and his paramours, colored like him in all particulars. She with the loveliest eyes upon her throat was known as Gracious Lady Pertolote. Courteous she was, discreet and debonair, compatible too, and took such care in her deportment. Since she was seven days old, she held the, sh the heart of Chanticleer controlled, locked up securely in her every limb. Oh, what a happiness, his love to him. And such a joy it was to hear them sing, as when the glorious sun began to spring, in sweet accord, my love is far from land. For in those days far off, I understand all birds and animals could speak and sing. Now it befell, as dawn began to spring, when Chanticleer and Pertolote and all his wives were perched in this poor widow's hall. Fair Pertolote was next to him on the perch. This Chanticleer began to groan and lurch like someone sorely troubled by a dream, and Pertolote, who heard him roar and scream, was quite aghast and said, Oh, dearest heart, what's ailing you? Why do you groan and start? Fie, what a sleeper, what a noise to make. Madam, he said, I beg you do not take offense, but by the Lord I had a dream so terrible just now I had to scream. I can still feel my heart racing from fear. God turn my dream to good and guard all here, and keep my body out of durance vile. I dreamt that roaming up and down a while within our yard I saw a kind of beast, a sort of hound that tried, or seemed at least, to try and seize me, would have killed me dead. His color was a blend of yellow and red. <laughs> Sorry. His ears and tail were dipped with sable fur, unlike the rest. He was a russet cur. Small was his snout. His eyes were glowing bright. It was enough to make one die of fright. That was no doubt what made me groan and swoon. For shame, she said, you timorous poltroon. Alas, what cowardice. By God above, you forfeited my heart and lost my love. I cannot love a coward, come what may. For certainly, whatever we may say, all women long, and oh, that it might be, 
for hav for husbands tough, dependable, and free, secret, discreet, no, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that word, it's the n-word, sort of, not a fool that boasts and then will find his courage cool out of it, uh, every trifling thing. By God above, how dare you say for shame and to your love that there was anything at all you feared? Have you no manly heart to match your beard? And can a dream reduce you to such terror? Dreams are a vanity, God knows, pure error. Dreams are engendered in the two replete from vapors in the belly, which complete with others to abundance, swollen tight. No doubt the redness in your dream tonight comes from the, super, the superfluity. I've said this word before. What is it? Comes from the superfluity. <laughs> superfluity. Yeah. No doubt the redness in your dream tonight comes from the superfluity and force of the red collar in your blood. Of course, that is what puts a dreamer in the dread of his crimsoned arrows, fires flaming red, of great red monsters making us to fight him, and big red whelps and little ones to bite him. Just so the black and melancholy vapors will set a, sl a sleeper shrieking, cutting capers and swearing that black bears, black bulls as well, or blackest fiends are hailing them to hell. And there are other vapors that I know that on a sleeping man will work their will, but I'll pass on as lightly as I can. Take Cato now, that was so wise a man. Did he not say, take no account of dreams? Now, sir, she said, on flying from these beams, for love of God, do take some laxative. Upon my soul, that's the advice to give for melancholy caller. Let me urge you, free yourself from vapors with a purge, and that you may have no excuse to tarry by saying this town has no apothecary. I shall myself instruct you and prescribe herbs that will cure all vapors of that tribe, herbs from our very farmyard. You will find their natural properties to unbind and purge you well beneath and well above. Now, don't forget it, dear, for God's own love. Your face is choleric and shows distension. Be careful lest the sun in his ascension should catch you full of humors, hot and many. And if he does, my dear, I'll lay a penny. Uh, I'll lay a penny. It means about... And if he does, my dear, I'll lay a penny. It means about a fever or a breath of tertian og. You may catch your death. Worms for a day or two I'll have to give as a digestive, then your laxative. Centauri, fumatory, caper spurge, and hellebore will make a splendid purge, and then there's laurel or the black thorn berry, ground ivy too that makes our yard so merry. Peck them right up, my dear, and swallow whole. Be happy, husband, by your father's soul. Don't be afraid of dreams. I'll say no more. Madam, he said, I thank you for your lore, but with regard to Cato all the same, his wisdom has, no doubt, a certain fame. But though he said that we should take no heed of dreams by God, in ancient books I read of many a man who, of, um, many a man of more authority than ever Cato was, believe you me, who say the very opposite is true, and prove their theories by experience too. Dreams have quite often been significations as well as as well of triumphs as of tribulations that people undergo in this our life. This needs no argument at all, dear wife. The proof is all too manifest indeed. One of the greatest authors one can read says thus, there were two comrades once who went on pilgrimage, sincere in their intent. And as it happened, they had reached a town where such a throng was milling up and down and yet so scanty the accommodation that they could not find themselves a habitation, no, not a cottage that could lodge them both. And so they separated, very loath, under constraint of this necessity, and each went off to find some ho hostelry, and to lodge whatever way his luck might fall. The first of them found refuge in a stall, down in a yard with oxen and a plow. His friend found lodging for himself somehow elsewhere, by accident or destiny, which governs all of us equally. Now it so happened, long ere it was day, this fellow had a dream, and as he lay in bed, it seemed he heard his comrade call, Help! I am lying in an ox's stall, and shall tonight be murdered as I lie. Help me, dear brother, help, or I shall die. Come in all haste. Such were the words he spoke. The dreamer, lost in terror, then awoke, but once awake, he paid it no attention, turned over and dismissed it as invention. It was a dream, he thought, a fantasy and twice he jumped this dream successively. 
Yet a third time, his comrade came again, or seemed to come, and said, I have been slain. Look, look, my wounds are bleeding wide and deep. Rise early in the morning, break your sleep, and go to the west gate. You there shall see a cart all loaded up with dung, said he. And in that dung my body has been hidden. Boldly arrest that cart as you are bidden. It was my money that they killed me for. He told him every detail, sighing sore and pitiful in feature, pale of hue. This dream, believe me, madam, turned out true. For in the dawn, as soon as it was light, he went to where his friend had spent the night, and when he came upon the cattle stall, he looked about him and began to call. The innkeeper, appearing thereupon, quickly gave an answer. Sir, your friend has gone. He left the town a little after dawn. The man began to feel suspicious, drawn by memories of his dream. The western gate, the dung cart, off he went. He would not wait towards the western entry. There he found, seemingly on its way to dung some ground, a dung cart loaded on the very plan described so closely by the, by the murdered man. So he began to shout courageously for right and vengeance on this felony. My friend's been killed. There's been a foul attack. He's in that cart and gaping on his back. Fetch the authorities, get the sheriff down, who have, whosoever, whosoever job it is to run the town. Help, my companions murdered, sent to glory. What need I to finish off the story? People ran out and cast the cart to the ground, and in the middle of the dung they found the murdered man. The corpse was fresh and new. O oh, blessed God, that art so just and true, thus thou revealest murder. As we say, murder will out. We see, we see it day by day, murders of foul, abominable treason, to, so loathsome to God's justice, to God's reason. He will not suffer its concealment. True, things may lie hidden for a year or two, but still, murder will out. That's my conclusion. All the town officers in great confusion seized on the carter, they, and they gave him hell. And then they racked the innkeeper as well, and both confessed. And then they took the wrecks, and there, and then they hanged them by their necks. By this we shall see that dreams are to be dreaded, and in the self-same book I find embedded, right in the very chapter after this, I'm not inventing, as I hope for bliss, the story of two men who started out to cross the sea for merchandise, no doubt, but as the winds were contrary, they waited. It was a pleasant town, I should have stated, merrily grouped about the haven side. A few days later, with the evening tide, the wind veered round so as to suit them best, they were delighted, and they went to rest, meaning to sail next morning early. Well, to one of them a miracle be befell. This man, as he lay sleeping, it would seem, just before dawn, had an astounding dream. So, I'm just going to summarize real quick. The two roosters are arguing about whether dreams are a valid form of truth, I guess. And the first one said, well, no, Cato, who's a... Roman guy, um, Cato says that dreams aren't to be trusted, and since he's super smart, we should follow his advice. And then the rooster Chanticleer, the guy one, um, he is saying that um, lots of people besides Cato, who are even more well-reputed well than Cato, have said that dreams should be trusted. And he already told the first story about the, the murdered guy in the dung cart, and now he's telling another story about someone on the boat, it seems like. All right. Um, this man, as he lay sleeping, it would seem, just before dawn, had an astounding dream. He thought a man was standing by his bed, commanding him to wait. And thus he said, If you set sail tomorrow, as you intend, you will be drowned. My tale is at an end. He woke and told his friend what had occurred and begged him that the journey be deferred at least a day, implored him not to start. But his companion, lying there apart, began to laugh and treat him to derision. I'm not afraid, he said, of any visit, of any vision, to let it interfere with my affairs. A straw for all your dreamings and your snares. Dreams are just empty nonsense, merest japes. Why, people dream of, people dream all day of owls and apes, all sorts of trash that can't be understood things that have never happened and never could. But as I see you mean to stay behind and miss the tide for willful sloth of mind. 
God knows I'm sorry for it, but good day. And so he took his leave and went his way.